What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. All right, let's get to the mailbag. Lots of people mad about Ant being this high, so let's get into some of your guys' comments. First, uh, kind of a big picture one, and then uh, a really, really good, well-thought-out uh, basketball case that I'm going to read you guys. I don't understand how a dude has one conference finals, a confer- has one playoff conference run, and he leapfrogs a dude that's been to five conference finals, two NBA finals, and has a championship so far. Remember, this list is not about credit. Tatum has certainly had a more productive and celebrated NBA career so far. If we were using last year's criteria, where it was mostly about credit, Tatum's going to be well over Ant, right? But that's just not the way uh, that this particular list works. I'm talking about guys to build a team around for this coming season. I'm saying that I like my chances to win the title, building from scratch a little bit more with Ant than I do with Tatum. All that said, Ant made my perennial MVP candidate list, but I do view him a little bit, I view a gap between four and five, meaning like I view one through four as like the top tier superstars and going from five to 11, I think those guys are kind of bunched up. So I don't see much of a gap between five and 11. So to be clear, I'm not saying I think Ant is much better than Tatum. I think he's barely better than Tatum, even though uh, Tatum, uh, even though Ant is all the way up at number five. We're going to get into some of the basketball specifics in this next question. I'm sorry, I can't understand Ant over Tatum. Ant has the exact same key weakness that Tatum does, less than elite efficiency as a jump shooter, but still shoots them at volume. But he has that weakness as a guard. Tatum was 27, 8, and 5 on 60% true shooting last year, turnover rate of 8.6%. Ant was 26, 5, and 5 on 58% true shooting, turnover rate of 10%. So Tatum put up superior offensive numbers despite having lower usage than Ant does. And then defensively, as much as Ant is an elite perimeter defender, Tatum is unquestionably a higher impact defensive player overall. This is mainly because he offers legitimate secondary rim protection, which was exactly why the Celtics were able to successfully shut down some the same Mavs attack that the Wolves' vaunted defense couldn't figure out. Tatum's size and athleticism offers unique versatility when scheming on defense in general that Ant does not. But on top of all that, Tatum is likely the superior perimeter defender as well. Think about that game this year where SGA was cooking Derek White and Drew Holiday because they didn't have the length to stop him. Then Tatum switched onto him for the fourth quarter and shut off the faucet. Think about the Nets series two years ago where Tatum clamped Durant and was getting legit blocks on his jumper. I highly doubt Anthony Edwards can contain longer perimeter stars like that at the same level Tatum can. It's just not. It's just Tatum isn't asked to be on the perimeter night in and night out. The Celtics also had eight more wins in the regular season than the Wolves and took home the chip. So, Tatum is a better player on both ends of the floor, higher efficiency, more experienced in every aspect, plays as many games, more versatile for scheming on both ends because of his size and strength, and just coming off of a title which Ant has never won. How can Ant then be the better player to build around for 24-25? You've admitted multiple times during Ant's hot streak last year that he was becoming one of your favorite players in the league. I think you've got to own up to a little bias coming into play here due to Ant being such a charismatic dog and a fun player to watch. Respect everything you do on this channel. My experience of the NBA has been much richer for listening to your content. That is probably the best com- a comment that I've received in terms of like making a basketball case since I started doing this list. So I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to write that all out. That's a damn good case. You did a very good job. That's how you argue about basketball. You don't just call someone a jackass and say they're wrong, you tell them why. And I I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. That's what makes this sort of thing fun. These are the kinds of debates that I love having. When I was uh, playing in college and we were done at practice and we were taking our shoes off and stuff, just sitting down on the sidelines talking shit or on the bus or on the plane or at the restaurant or whatever, these are the kinds of conversations we would have. And, you know, obviously we weren't as much into the statistical weeds as I am now, but that was the kind of conversations that we had. and, And that's what I enjoy doing as a basketball fan. Also, before we get to Ant, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating is you talked about how uh, uh, Tatum's secondary rim protection is how they shut down the Mavs, and specifically putting Tatum on the center. And uh, you put that the Wolves' vaunted defense couldn't figure it out. The reason why I'm singling this out first is I don't think it has anything to do with Ant. Uh, I was really fascinated after that series, after watching the finals, 
that Minnesota didn't try that. That Minnesota didn't try putting, uh, just like putting Gobert on PJ Washington or on Derek Jones Jr. and letting someone like Cat guard uh, uh, the center. So that they, uh, but the thing is, this cat can't guard in space, so it would have to be like Jaden. But then again, it's like I don't think go, I don't think Gafford and uh, Gafford and, and Lively didn't get enough offensive rebounds in the finals. And I'd be curious to see like if Jaden McDaniel's was there, and you like just tried switching that, maybe with a bigger look with Kyle Anderson on the floor, and you put like Kyle Anderson on Luca, or maybe Jaden on Luca and Kyle Anderson on the center, and tried switching that with Gobert roaming off of PJ Washington. I'm just curious, like. I'm not curious why we didn't see it because it was kind of a new look. Like this, this concept of like putting your centers on opposing weak above the break shooters and guarding their center with a uh, like a forward. That's still a relatively new M- NBA concept. And so, give the credit to uh, Joe Missoula for conceptualizing just a really good defensive game plan. Uh, against Dallas, but there is some truth to the fact that you have to have a big forward like Tatum that can one guard centers and switch on to uh, switch on to the ball handler in order for that look to make sense. But there's another side of that too. Like you also have to have your on ball guy be big enough. Like it only works if Jalen Brown can also switch on to centers because you're going to switch that Luca center pick and roll in that case. And so uh, I know we're not talking about Ant at this point, but like just strictly talking about defensive game planning, that is a really interesting point. Like. That that concept of putting your forward on the opposing center and putting your center on their weakest above the break shooter, I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the NBA in the coming years because it's copycat league. And Joe Missoula leaned hard into it most of the season too. Like you go back in the regular season, Tatum's guarding centers a lot. And so like I think that's going to be just a really interesting concept to see over the next couple of years as more teams try to adapt to that. But there is a personnel element to it that extends beyond one player. You have to have like a group of personnel that is capable of executing that type of coverage. On that note, let's get into your uh, some of your points. Uh, one, you were talking about uh, his regular season production. I've said in the uh, in this episode, and obviously you wrote this comment before I wrote this episode, but Ansley took place in the postseason run. He's j- he just turned twenty three, so like that's the way this is going to work is going to be much more of like a um, uh, like Ant is at a different phase of his career where he's improving exponentially on a on a year over year basis, right? And he's a different player now than he was in the regular season. He's been a flat out deadly shooter his entire postseason career and just had a really good summer shooting the basketball through both his playoff run and with Team USA. So like, I agree with you that last year in the regular season, Ant had the same issue as Tatum, which was high volume, inefficient pull-up jump shooting. But Ant seems to be kicking that issue and and shooting at a really high rate in a large sample size. Um, and again, who knows what's going to happen in the long run. Maybe Ant will take a, a huge downturn in shooting and maybe Tatum will take a huge upswing. But I, I, I am betting, I, I am saying that I believe Ant's jump shooting is real. He's also a great free throw shooter. He shot 84% on free throws last year. That is always a, a strong indicator of shooting touch. And then lastly, he gets better looks than everyone else because his first step is so crazy that it has everyone on their heels. So like, I think a big part of why he shoots so well is he just gets a lot of really good looks. So to put it simply, like I think Ant is a more useful uh, offensive player in a vacuum because he's a substantially better athlete with a much quicker first step who's also a better shooter both off the catch and off the dribble. So he's giving me more rim pressure and more jump shooting to counter it. So like building from scratch as a GM, I think that's easier for me to work with. Now let's get into Tatum a little bit. Tatum is definitely a better passer, but he's not an elite passer either. He's just better than Ant. And that carries a lot of value in the Celtics roster where they're surrounded by all these really good players, right? But this list implies I'm not getting Tatum, Jalen Brown, Derek White, Drew Holiday, Kristaps Porzingis, and Al Horford. Like, I'm likely getting, in this scenario where we're drafting, chances are all the teams are going to be relatively even with talent. And so chances are, instead of Tatum playing with five other great two-way players, He's probably going to play with maybe like one really great two-way two way player and probably like two offensive specialists and then probably like two defensive specialists, right? Like it's going to be much more of like a mix of different types of talent, which at that point, Tatum's lack of offensive high end 
becomes a more of a problem and his playmaking becomes less valuable in, in that specific regard. And that's really the thing is like Tatum is kind of hard to build around from scratch because he's kind of like a B minus to B plus on everything when it comes to the offensive end of the floor, right? Like his durability on offense is impressive. He's always available and he shoots enough threes and gets to the foul line enough that he can maintain efficiency and volume. That's why he's always going to be like 27 points per game, 60% true shooting, 27 points per game, 60% true shooting. But he doesn't have an elite first step. He's got good size for the position, but he's not like physically dominant on offense the way guys like Kawhi Leonard or LeBron James are. He's a good shooter. Like I genuinely think he's a good shooter who's just in a bad slump. Like and I've said that many times, but he's certainly not a great shooter. And he's a good passer, but he's certainly not a great passer. So, like, he doesn't really have an A-plus offensive trait. And so, like, when I have Ant, where I have this real A-plus offensive trait, which is, like, among players below 6'6", he's the best at getting to the rim. Definitely gets to the rim more than Tatum, despite significantly inferior spacing. And when I combine that with him also being a much better jump shooting threat, I just think that that top-end ability is something that I can build around easier as a kind of a vacuum draft sort of situation where I'm not going to have like massive talent advantages the way that Tatum does within Boston. I do think Tatum is a better defensive player. I, I you, you broke it down at length. We went into it a little bit earlier, but I do expect that gap to continue to shrink as the years go by. Again, as we know, Ant does have all world defensive potential that we do see in spurts, like we saw with Jamal Murray in game seven, but it's definitely too inconsistent at this point. I also definitely agree with you that Tatum is much more versatile defensively. I can do more with him. I can plug him into different types of roles. So if you were making the case for Tatum over Ant, like if I, uh, like if you were making a list and you had Tatum at five and Ant at seven, then that would be the angle I would take. Like, I, like that defensive angle is the one that makes a lot of sense to me and you're making a really good case. Comparing the Celtics to the Wolves is pointless, in my opinion. One, the record is uh, thrown off a little bit by the fact that the Western Conference just was significantly more talented. I, I, I can't remember the stat off the top of my head, but the West kicked the shit out of the Eastern Conference in head-to-head -head matchups this year. And then the Celtics just had a lot more talent. Like, again, like Tatum was surrounded by five legitimate two-way players. If you want to say Porzingis is... And, and Horford are, are somewhat one-dimensional defensively because Horford's not as big and Porzingis can't guard in space as well. I'll give you that, but at least four awesome two-way players around him, right? So like, or at least three, I should say, it, between Jalen Brown, Drew Holiday, and, and, and Derek White. Most teams in the league don't have that type of two-way talent. Like that's like the other team that does is like, is like Oklahoma City, right? And that's the team that you're looking at. But most teams don't have that luxury. Most teams don't have the luxury of like every guy can shoot well, pass well, and defend well. That that's that's really rare, you know. And like to put it simply, like if you put Anthony Edwards on that Celtics team, he's getting he's getting to the rim a dozen times a game. Or, or you're gonna have to double him every time at the rim where he's gonna generate a bunch of driving kick opportunities. Like Anthony Edwards with real true five out spacing where everyone can shoot would be a terrifying thing to deal with for any defense. And like, that's the thing. When you look at that Wolves roster, like they had elite defensive personnel. That's a good roster, really big on the front line, some really interesting, talented players, but everyone's got flaws, right? Like everyone there, it's like Mike Conley is a really interesting offensive player to help kind of grease the wheels and, and run pick and roll with Rudy Gobert and to spot up shoot and to hit his textbook, you know, kind of famous right-handed floater that he makes. And Carl Anthony Towns is going to have his games where he gets 26 points. And But the, uh, but like not, neither of those guys are, are truly useful defensive players. And Jaden McDaniels might be the best perimeter defender in the league. It, it's a, it's, I, I don't necessarily think I'd pick him, but he's in the top tier. You know, and, and Rudy Gobert is not the, he's certainly in the top tier of defensive players in the league, is in the top five of all 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 around defensive talent in the league. But both of those guys have some real limitations on the offensive end of the floor. Like you're the concept that the Celtics the think of it just simply through this lens. Like the game plan for Dallas against Dallas for Boston was to concede wide open above the break threes to iffy shooters like Derek Jones or PJ Washington. If you tried that against Boston, they would light you on fire because all of them can shoot so well. So, like, again, like, I, again, I, I still have Tatum at seven, 
you guys know how much I value Tatum and his defensive versatility and, and how well he fits in with that group. But, like, guys, that Celtics roster is, like, other than, like, true superstar-laden rosters, like the 2017 Warriors or, like, the 2013 Heat or, like, the 01 Lakers, like, aside from the teams that just have insane top-end talent, like, that's that's damn near a perfect roster that Brad Stevens has put together. And it makes basketball a lot easier for guys like Tatum than it does for other guys around the league. Um, the last bit, I will freely admit that I, as a fan of basketball, like Ant more than I like Jason Tatum. He's quickly becoming one of my favorite players. That's just, that's just, that's just, I'm just being honest with you. It's just, it's, I don't go into it with the preconceived notion. I watch the games and there are certain players that I really like and certain players that I don't like as much. It's all just normal. It's the same way you guys feel when you watch. You guys probably just have different players that you like or dislike, right? But to be clear, I try very hard to fight my biases on these lists and you kind of just have to take my word for it that I'm being objective. I understand that some of you guys don't believe me and that I'll never be able to change your mind, but I really am trying. I, I really am trying the best I can to be objective. But to be clear, that comment was the best and most well thought one, uh, well thought out one that I've seen since we started this list. So I really appreciate you taking the time to write that down. Hey, Jason, love the show and the ranking segment. Tatum should be way higher, specifically over Shea. He's the most versatile player in the league right now. During this playoff run, he was the primary offensive initiator while drawing the toughest defensive assignment. He finished the playoff run leading his team in points, rebounds, assists against Bam, Mobley, and double teams from Indiana and Dallas. On defense, he can guard one through five and threw everyone's offensive game plan off by guarding centers. Against Dallas specifically, he shut down the lob threat completely. His shooting slump was brutal, but he still contributed at the highest level. Shea is a more efficient scorer, but that's really it. He takes the fourth assignment on defense and can operate, can only operate with the ball in his hands. It seems like your ranking is a lot on projection, but Shea is only a year younger than Tatum and the bodies of work aren't comparable. Tatum has won more playoff series than Shea has won playoff games. That's a crazy stat. He's gone toe-to-toe with Giannis, Embiid, Butler, Durant, Curry, LeBron, and Luka in huge games and come out on top consistently. Shea's best playoff run was a second-round exit, and the only series he's won was against a Pelicans team without Zion. His team is poised to have a lot of success in these next few years, but if OKC and Boston beat in the finals, I'll take Tatum's experience and resume every time. So I'm not going to get into some of the specifics with Tatum because I like just did that with the previous comment, but to really simply respond... I think Shea is in like a completely different stratosphere than Tatum as an offensive player, specifically as an offensive engine, while also being a legitimately good two-way player. So to be honest, I never even considered Tatum to be over SGA. I just I just never gave that a real look. What's wild is you said Ant over Tatum mid-playoff run, then you came back after he was eliminated and said you were caught in the moment that Tatum is better right now, but you wouldn't be surprised if Ant passes him even next season. Then Boston wins a ring, and now Ant is back over Tatum. You do realize Ant hasn't done anything Tatum hasn't already done, even when he was Ant's age. So I understand that this can be confusing, and I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, but like talking about who's better is all about what criteria we're using. Like If I was just sitting here and I was like, I was like, well, um, I think that LeBron's better than than Tatum. Like, w- what do you mean? Like, for tomorrow? Like, because, like, yeah, I probably agree. But, like, for starting a season tomorrow, like a full season, it's a completely different conversation, right? Like, when someone says who's better at basketball, there's it's usually one of three things, right? Like, it's – which I went over at the beginning of the show. Best for a game or series who starts tomorrow – best for an entire season from start to finish or the bragging rights piece, right? Like that's the, bra- the bragging rights piece is tough, right? That's what a lot of Celtics fans are playing right now. That's what a lot of the people have been do- doing in these comments. Like Tatum just won the title. Why isn't he higher? Okay. So that's bragging rights. You're saying regardless of what all the team circumstances and other things going on are, Tatum has the trophy. Therefore he should be number one. That's bragging rights, right? Best for a game that starts tomorrow totally different conversation best for an entire season that goes from start to finish totally different conversation adding the modifier that we're doing a a whole draft from scratch that's a different conversation right and so like yeah at the moment when ant lost and i'll even extend it to today if i had to start a playoff series tomorrow i'm giving tatum a slight edge over ant and that's with me giving him grace because of his poor jump shooting. Like, that's me thinking that he would shoot better uh, if he was, like, the number one option on the team and everything was flowing through him, which, by the way, he just did in the playoffs and didn't shoot very well. But giving him that grace, yeah, I'd give 
Tatum a slight edge over Ant right now. But I think that by next April, Ant's going to pass him. And I also think that Ant in the regular season is a really useful offensive engine. And I think specifically if I was building a roster from scratch, Ant's A-plus offensive trait, which is elite downhill athleticism combined with his pull-up shooting, which has been far more deadly than Jason Tatum, especially as of late, I want I want Ant. And so, again, that, that that's where these conversations get a little bit tougher. Bragging rights, yeah, it's Tatum. Best for a game tomorrow, yeah, it's Tatum. But that's not the purpose of this particular list. And that's why I broke down the criteria at the beginning. That's why I've, re- I've re-emphasized and gone over the criteria like 35 times over the course of this list because I think that's where most of the uh, the gap in our our perspective has come from. Two more. AD, Shea, and Ant over Tatum is hilarious. Only one of those players has proven that they can be the best player on a team and win a championship. Tatum being a team player and all about winning while taking a hit to his counting stats is exactly why he'd be the perfect player to build around. He's already shown he can average 30 in a season. Dude just played point guard on offense and guarded the other team center on defense. So first of all, like that, this is where it gets tricky with the bragging rights thing. And this is why I don't do bragging rights anymore. We do bragging rights, I'm going to do a video. So like, After this week, next week on Monday, I'm going to do one video where I rank like the top five bragging rights guys from last year. But so we're going to do it. But like for the purpose of this list, I I don't like to do that anymore. I think that that we made some mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes was last year I had Luca at 10 because he missed the playoffs. So for bragging rights, I had to have him lower. But then like he went and kicked everyone's ass this year and got all the way to the playoffs or all the way to the finals. So like that's where that, that type of list has a certain amount of flaw to it, right? Um, let's put it this way. This is why the bragging rights thing is silly. Tatum won the trophy and he just played the worst playoff basketball of his prime by far. Like he was in close to as good as he was in 2022 when he lost. So that's, what's kind of ridiculous. Like to put it, here's another angle for it. Like, you know who else won a title and didn't win finals MVP? Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis's two way play in the 2020 playoffs was infinitely more impressive than Jason Tatum. He was better than Tatum on both ends of the floor in that playoff run by a wide margin. So like, so that's why I don't, I don't, I think just pointing to this particular playoff run and and them winning the trophy is just a a weak case to put Tatum over people, uh, over people for last question. Why can't the Lakers make the playoffs outright with two top 10 players? That's weird. I get versions of this question all the time. It's really this simple. Uh, The Lakers were a hell of a lot better then their record would lead you to believe because they had one bad stretch over about three weeks in late December and early January. They were one of the best teams in the league to start the year, and they were one of the best teams in the league to end the year. Also, the Western Conference is super, super deep with talent. If you actually just look through the Western Conference standings, there's just not much of a gap in that middle portion. All of them are just kind of jammed up on each other. Like there's just more good teams in the West. When there are more good teams in the West, it's going to be more competitive. It's going to be harder to jockey for playoff positioning. It's going to be harder to put up bigger win totals. That's just that's just to be expected. The West head to head kicked the shit out of the Eastern Conference this year. Even Boston, for as good as they were, they were just 3 and 5 in their eight matchups against the top 4 seeds in the Western Conference. The Western Conference was just an entirely different battle. Other little known fact, like if you take out that three and 10 stretch, the Lakers just look like an awesome team. Like again, awesome to start the year, won the in-season tournament. Uh, From January 7th on, they were like one of the top four records in the league. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I'll I'll pull it up in a minute. But like they were one of the top records in the league. They, uh, um, uh, They had 17 wins, according to Cleaning the Glass, against teams that were in the top 10 in point differential. Uh, would the only team that had that many wins other than the Lakers was Boston. So like that, like the Lakers, and then they went and played the defending champs and outplayed them the majority of the series. They just got gamed by Jamal Murray twice, which ended up costing them the series. Like they, they went blow for blow with the team that hoisted the trophy last year. So like, again, like were the, I didn't think the Lakers were a top tier championship contender. I had, I had Denver one and I had Boston two. And then I had a gap. And then I had everyone else. And I think I had the Lakers sixth. I had them like fifth or sixth. So no, I don't think the Lakers were going to win the title. I don't think the Lakers were going to beat Boston. I didn't think the Lakers were going to beat Denver. I picked them to lose that series. But I do think the Lakers were a hell of a lot better than their uh, uh, than their than their uh, position in the standings would lead you to believe. And quite frankly, like for LeBron and AD to be 
what I consider to be the sixth best team in the league, um, uh, f- to be the sixth sixth best team in the league with LeBron and AD on the roster, that goes to show you they overcame a lot. That was with the limitation of Darvin Ham as the coach. That was with the lack of two way role players. Like honestly, I thought LeBron and AD did more than pulling their weight. And like when people say like why didn't they make the playoffs outright despite the fact that LeBron and AD are top ten players, and it's like did you watch them play? They were awesome every night. They were literally awesome all the time. And the issue was some rotation stuff in the middle of the season. And then the fact that they literally do not have, like their starting five is Austin Reeves, D'Lo and Rui. Good players, but it's poorly balanced. There's nobody in, none of those guys are above average defensive players. That's the problem. And so like they were constantly trying to overcome that. But by the way, I pulled up the number over their final 46 games of the year, which was from January 7th on, they were 30 and 16. That was the fourth best record in the league. Like that was more than half the season sample size. They were one of the best offenses in the league. So like a lot of people, like to be clear, like if you were under the impression that the Lakers were a bad basketball team, that's just not accurate. That's just not accurate to what was actually happening last year. Were they a top tier championship contender? No, but they were firmly in the mix in that next group that was below them. 